Good morning and welcome to our online worship experience. My name is Dave Mason and I serve on the ministry staff here at the Heath Church of Christ. And just now we're going to worship the Lord through the preaching of his word, through communion, through prayer, through music, and through hearing how God has affected the lives of his people. I invite you now to join us as we worship God together. Hey everybody, my name is Jim Roberts. I have the honor of serving on the finance team here at Heath Church of Christ. We thought now would be a good time to give everybody a few updates on some things that are going on with our finances here at the church. First, I wanted to let you know that even though we've had these difficult times over the last six months with the pandemic and the shutdown and the slow comeback, finances here at the Heath Church of Christ have been very good. We appreciate your faithful giving and we've really appreciated the fact that the money has continued to come in so we can continue to offer such great services and great opportunities for Christians to grow. So we really wanna thank you for that. We wanna let you know that that has been the case. Secondly, I wanted to let you know that uh, the pay payroll protection plan that was created by the federal government to allow businesses to take loans to help cover expenses during these difficult times was something that we were eligible for here at the Heath Church of Christ. Very early on, we had a meeting with the elders and the staff, and as a, as a unanimous group, we decided not to pursue any sort of outside funding, any sort of government loans or government assistance. There were several reasons for that. The most obvious was our faith in God and our, and our trust in the people of HCC that the continuing money would come in, and that has worked out very well, as I mentioned previously. Another thing that we considered, however, was that there were probably other churches in locations that maybe were hit harder or churches that would have a difficult time absorbing the, the challenges to the budget that, that it would occur uh, that would need this money much more than we would. And so we felt like it was in the best stewardship of, of our money and the best stewardship of the government's money that we would not pursue that. So I wanted to let everybody know that that was the case with the PPP loans. We did not pursue it and we were very happy that we chose not to do that because we think it was the right thing to do. Finally, I wanted to update everybody on our landmark program. As most of you know, the Landmark Program is the, the plan to pay down the loan that we took out when we built this fantastic building that we're in. And just to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history, from 2004 to 2011, we were only able to reduce the principal balance of our loan from $3.4 million down to $3.1 million, so about $300,000 in seven years. In 2011, we started the Landmark Program. And since then, we have been able to reduce the principal balance of our loan by over $2.1 million. So that's just in the last nine years. So that leads me to the most exciting part of this entire announcement, and that is that August 30th is another Landmark Sunday. And this August 30th, when we collect our Landmark money and make the payment to the bank, we will reduce our principal balance amount on our loan to under $1 million. We're so excited to be able to make that announcement. We're so excited that that's the case. And we've worked so hard as a church to get to this point so we can start to see the end in sight on the loan on this building which will then again free up more money for us to just spend it on so many other programs that will be so valuable for god's kingdom we thank you for your giving we thank you for your faithfulness we ask that you continue to do so and we just look forward to the great things we have in store together here at hcc god bless The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light and Darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God And all will see How great How great is our God And age to age he stands
see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all names, worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great. See how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Don't see how great, how great is our God. Well, hello everyone. We are continuing our series from Jeremiah called Run with Horses. And I want to just begin by reviewing what the main idea is behind this series. The prophet Jeremiah served the Lord and served God's people during a most difficult point in the history of Judah. When the prophet comes before God to express his frustrations of what he's dealing with, he, he goes and he talks to the Lord, look at what I'm dealing with here, Lord. God responds to him with these words recorded in Jeremiah 12, 5. If racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? In other words, God is telling this tired old prophet, yes, these are difficult times. But understand, right now, you're just running with men. I'm calling you to greater things. You will run with horses. So he's telling this man of God, don't give up. Stay in the race. Don't run on your own power. Keep up the good work. Now, I can't think of a more appropriate reminder in these difficult times that we're living in right now than what God tells Jeremiah in those verse, that verse, Jeremiah 12, 5. So today, as we continue this series, I want to invite you to follow with me to another passage in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 10. And here's how we're going to approach this today. Very simply, we're just going to go phrase by phrase or verse by verse through these 10 verses, and we're going to make our observations and applications as we go along here. So uh, as we read this, you'll see here, I have divided this passage into three different headings. And so the first heading would be this. I'm calling the first four verses, the situation, Jeremiah 17, verses 1 through 4. The situation in Jeremiah's time was bleak. This book was written around 600 years before the time of Christ. And so at this point in Judah's history, now Judah is the southern part of Israel, the nation was undergoing a great moral decline. Now in the midst of this moral decline, there was a brief time of reform 
led by a king named Josiah. He was the king that had found uh, a copy of God's law and was convicted when he read that. And he began to initiate some re reforms in the, in the land of Judah at that time. And he ordered the tearing down of false idols that many had taken to worshiping uh, during this time. But sadly, there were many who resisted the reforms of Josiah and they clung to their false gods in opposition uh, to God's way. And so now before we begin reading this passage in Jeremiah 17, I want to point out something that's important here. If you were to just open up the book of Jeremiah and all you read were these 10 verses that you're, we're going to look at today, you may have the impression that the people in this day were beyond any hope of redemption, that God had just given up on them, and He was only concerned with inflicting punishment on them in this time. But I want you to think of this passage in this way. This Jeremiah is a 52-chapter book, and today what we're going to do is just take a periscope and come up in the middle of this chapter. We're going to just look at 10 verses out of 52 chapters chapters here. And so this gives a pretty bleak situation here. However, it's not the full picture that we're looking at just in these 10 verses. So let's look here in verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah lays out the situation here. First of all, he points out the reality of embedded sin that was taking place in this time. The sin of Judah is inscribed with an iron chisel engraved with a diamond point on their stony hearts and on the corners of their altars. That's the first verse there. Notice that imagery that Jeremiah uses there that, that, uh, that as he speaks to God's people, that iron chisel with a diamond point. Now, when God wanted a message to be remembered, there were certain times that he would command that message to be engraved in stone. I imagine that you, you're probably thinking of the most famous example of God's message being engraved in stone would be the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain and presented to the people. And so here we have a picture of the sins of the people being permanently inscribed onto their hearts of stone. It was done with an iron chisel, with a diamond Point. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever scraped your car against something and you, and you look at it and you know that feeling. If you scraped your car against something, you get out and you look at it. And the first thing, usually I say, I'm, I'm just hope against hope. I think, you know what? I'm, I'm looking at this, this scratch here on my car. I bet I can buff that out. I bet I can buff that out. And usually that's kind of wishful thinking, hoping you can do that. And so you think, I'll, I'll get some rubbing compound and I'll try to, try to rub that mark out of the finish of my car. I'll get some polish, some, uh, some wax and try to wax that out of there and got to get rid of that scratch. And sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can buff it out. But sometimes when you go to, to buff things out, you'll notice, oh no, this is a scratch. This is somebody's taken their key and, and made a deep scratch in the paint of my car and it's going to lead to rust. What God is saying to the people here is that your sins are etched on your heart. And sometimes we think, well, we can just buff that out of our lives. And God's saying, hey, there's no buffing this out. Your sin is deeply carved into the deepest part of your being. And in this, this, past, in this verse here, it says that their sin was also chiseled on the corners of their altars, or some of your translations might read, on the horns of their altars. The altar in the Old Testament represented the atonement of sin. An animal would be sacrificed and the blood placed on the horns or the corners of the altar, and that would satisfy the, uh, the righteous wrath of God for a time, atoning for the sins of the people. But now, that blood of the animals that would atone for their sins is replaced with a permanent etching of their very sins on the altar that was meant to, quote unquote, remove their sins. Sin was embedded into their hearts and embedded into the fabric of their society. 
So along with this embedded sin, the people had generational sin. Look here in verse 2. Even their children go to worship at the pagan altars and at the Asherah poles beneath every green tree and on every high hill. You see, not only were these people sinning, they were passing their sinful practices and their sinful attitudes from one generation to the next. Their main offense in this day was the worship of Baal. And, and you see these phrases in here like the, uh, the pagan altars, the Asherah poles, the green trees, high hills. Those terms there it was referring to the worship of Baal. And it took place at these pagan altars and, and beneath these trees and up on those high hills. And so this generation, instead of passing their faith on from one generation to the next, these people are passing on their sinful practices and their sinful attitudes from one generation to the next. They exchanged the holy hill of God for the high hills of Baal. So God's people were marked by embedded sin, chiseled into their very hearts. And God's people were marked by generational sin, and ultimately they were marked by destructive sin. Continuing in verse 4, so I will hand over my holy mountain along with all your wealth and treasures and your pagan shrines as plunder to your enemies. For sin runs rampant in your land. The wonderful possession I have reserved for you will slip from your hands. I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land. For my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. And so because God's people had chosen to turn away from righteousness and because they had chosen to embed themselves in sin, God was about to shake them up. He was about to remove all the things in which they had falsely taken security. That was the situation. And that leads us to our second heading, which we'll call the choice, which is verses 5 through 8. We'll continue reading here. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. We're continuing here. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now, as you read this passage here, uh, one thing I notice is that it resembles some of the readings that you'll find in the book of Proverbs and also in the book of Psalms. These are put together in a poetic fashion and kind of as a, a proverb, a lot of times in the book of Proverbs, you'll have two contrasting ideas. And this is what Jeremiah does here. This is what the Lord does and as he's giving these, this message to Jeremiah to deliver to the people here. And so here, contrasting these two ideas here, kind of in a form of a proverb, which is actually a prophecy, Jeremiah makes a comparison here between two plants. So follow this imagery here. You have the image of a shrub and the image of a tree. Now here's what is said about the shrub, and here's what's said about the tree. The shrub is cursed. The tree is blessed. The shrub has no hope. The tree has no worries. The shrub is in a barren wilderness producing nothing. The tree is producing fruit, even in the midst of a drought. So as you look at that and as you think about the verses that we just read, according to Jeremiah's prophecy, how does a person come to be either a shrub or a tree? Well, the difference between a shrub and a tree is in whom they put their trust. 
those who put their trust in people will end up like the shrub, but those who put their trust in God will end up like the tree. Now, as you read this, you, you might ask, well, is this implying that I should never trust another person? Am I supposed to look at everyone with whom I come in contact uh, with some kind of suspicion and never trust another human being? And I think that there's an important distinction that needs to be made here. There is a difference between trusting someone and trusting in someone. I have a lot of people in my life that I trust, but I don't trust in them. Trusting in someone is replacing that person with, uh, re replacing God with that person, putting that person in God's rightful place. And you can trust in people. You can also falsely trust in things. And we need to understand that whatever or whomever we put our trust in, eventually we will find ourselves at the mercy of. And I don't know about you, but I only want to be at the mercy of the living, righteous, and merciful God. So let me ask you a question as we think about this. Would you consider yourself to be a shrub or a tree? Which best describes you, the shrub or the tree? You know, let me ask you, let me ask this another way. Think about this. If, uh, if things were to change in life or there were some kind of a horrible thing that were to take place, let me ask you this. What if, what if everything were taken away? What if there was a time of drought? Would you react more like the shrub or the tree? What if? God forbid, the country folded. What would your reaction be? Would you be like the shrub and wither and die? Or would you be like the tree and find your sustenance in something else? What if the economy crashes? Would you be like the shrub or the tree? What if your retirement savings suddenly evaporated? Would you be like the shrub? Or would you react like the tree? Think about it this way. What if we were not able to get back to normal life or normal worship, quote unquote, whatever that might be, for a, an extended amount of time, for another year or so? Will our reaction be like the shrub or the tree? The difference between the shrub and the tree is in whom you put your trust. So, we see here the situation. We see here the choice that is put before the people. And now let's move on to the final heading in these final two verses. And the final heading is this, the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Now, you know, when you preach a message or when you speak to people, you're, you're supposed to end with hope and you're supposed to end with a good word here. Now, in, in preaching terms, if you're stopping at the end of this passage here, it really doesn't offer much hope here in these final two verses here. It doesn't give us much confidence or hope in the human condition. As one commentator puts it, sin makes its mark upon the human heart, even with the force of an iron pen and the depth of a diamond point. That is the condition of the human heart. So where is the good news in all of this? Let's think back again to that idea of we're looking at these 10 verses and that's a periscope view of Jeremiah's prophecy. And we have to back up and to take a broader view to understand the good news that is to come. I want you to look with me at another passage later on in the book of Jeremiah, and here you'll find some good news. It's in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. Here's the hope. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and note this. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Folks, that promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah gives us this hopeful promise that one day in Christ, those deeply embedded sins chiseled on the stony hearts of the people of God will be replaced with his instructions. One day, that relationship will be restored. What we see here is that when we are at our worst, that is when God is at his best. Maybe you are watching this today and you're thinking to yourself, maybe you've had this thought that, well, my life is beyond repair. I am beyond hope. I just have sin chiseled into my very being and there's nothing that can be done. Friend, there is hope in Christ uh, for all who would seek him. And when we are at our worst, that's when God is at his best. Perhaps you're listening today and you would like to have a conversation about taking that next step of, or what it means to have those sins erased and have it replaced with God's Holy Spirit inside your life and, and to, to live faithfully for Christ. If you want to uh, talk about having that, uh, taking that next step or having that relationship with Christ, being baptized into Him, I would encourage you to text the word RESPOND to 740-303-7898. That's just a simple way where we can connect with one another and we can begin that conversation. Again, that's RESPOND to 740 303 7898. Now at this time, as we think about this idea of when we were at our worst, God was at his best. One passage that truly illustrates that is found in the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. The apostle Paul says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Man at his worst, God at his best. And we remember that in a very tangible way when we come together and we participate in communion or the Lord's Supper. And I'm gonna invite you right now to just join with me and we're going, I'm gonna just guide you through uh, the receiving of the elements of the Lord's Supper when we take the Lord's Supper together, we remember the torn flesh of Christ on the cross at Calvary through uh, the bread that we eat. We also remember his blood that was shed for, on our behalf through the juice that we drink. And as I'm gonna read this passage one more time, and then I'm gonna encourage you to go ahead and take those emblems here. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross and his flesh was torn for us. Please take the bread at this time. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and his blood was shed on our behalf. And as we remember this, let's drink the juice at this time. Father in heaven, I thank you so much again for the privilege to be a part of your kingdom, a part of the Heath Church of Christ, and I thank you for your graciousness that you've shown to us. We thank you for your warnings that you give us through, through prophets like Jeremiah, but we also thank you for the hope that you have given us through Christ. And Father, it's my prayer that if there's anybody listening here today, anybody watching this, that has not yet accepted Christ as Savior, that they would have the courage to reach out and begin that conversation, that we could see more and more people coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. We lift up this prayer before you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Here I stand before you now As honestly as I know how Broken by the days gone by Spirit help my soul to rise But still I fail and Even then you're with me there You remind me I'm a child of God Regardless of the things I've done All my hope is found in your perfect love Triumphs over judgment Love wider than horizons Stronger than all sin Lord, your kindness Leads us to To ever save a sinner's soul But my God says to the prodigal My beloved one, you're welcome home Your mercy triumphs over
Here I stand before you now As honestly as I know how Regardless of the things I've done All my hope is found in perfect love My hope is found in your open arms Thank you again for joining us on our online worship experience. If you've heard something today that, and you have questions about faith or you're ready to take a next step in your faith journey, such as being baptized, uh, we would love to have a conversation with you. One simple way you can reach out to us is by simply texting the word RESPOND to 740-303-7898. If you do so, someone will contact you and we'll start that conversation about your next step in faith. You can also call the church office and we would be glad to talk with you and guide you through your faith journey. If you would like to give today, we still have the online uh, giving option available and you can find links for that down below this video. You can also mail in your offering if you would like to do so. Also, just a reminder, our church doors are open and we are worshiping each Sunday morning at 9 and 1030. And we're following all of the current protocols. And as those change, those get updated on our website. Again, thank you for worshiping with us today. Have a wonderful week.